गुड मॉर्निंग फ्रेंड्स माई टॉपिक फॉर द डे इज डायबिटिक आई डिजीज फ्रॉम पोल टू पोल एट द आउटसेट आई वुड लाइक टू थैंक डॉक्टर वितुल गुप्ता फॉर इन्वाइटिंग मी फॉर टूडेज प्रेजेंटेशन वेन वी टॉक ऑफ डायबिटिक आई डिजीज इट इज यूजली इन अनकंट्रोल डायबिटीज दैट वी स्टार्ट हैविंग रेटिनोपैथी एंड अदर इन्वॉल्वमेंट ऑल दो रेटिनोपैथी इज अ वेल नोन कॉम्प्लिकेशन ऑफ डायबिटीज द अदर इन्वॉल्वमेंट आर लेसर नोन टू द जनरल प्रैक्टिशनर टूडे आई वुड इलेबरेट ऑन द आई डिजीज फ्रॉम द एंटीरियर दैट मीन्स द आउटर सर्फेस ऑफ द आई टू द इनर मोस्ट पोस्टीरियर पोल ऑफ द आई स्टार्टिंग फ्रॉम द बेल्स पॉलिसी और द सेवंथ क्रेनियल नर्व पॉलिसी इन्वॉल्व द आई इन सच अ वे दैट the eye cannot be fully closed apart from other manifestations of bell's palsy as you all know the consequences of bell's palsy are that the patient is exposed to the external environment and there can be all sorts of corneal ulcerations and other complications of corneal ulcerations the treatment is good control of diabetes and systemic steroids can be given for bell's palsy but not in diabetes because diabetes is a, itself a country contraindication for systemic steroids next is the involvement of the other cranial nerves which are responsible for the ocular motility that means the third fourth and the sixth nerve these lead, can lead to partial or complete ophthalmoplegia that means the eyes cannot be moved when there is a involvement of a single nerve the involvement is partial and it can be either the third nerve involvement fourth or the sixth nerve involvement sometimes all the three are involved together and the patient has a total ophthalmoplegia and cannot the move, move the eye in any direction next is hyperlipidemia which leads to xanthelisma over the eyelids and dispigmented spots these dispigmented spots are a cosmetic problem and these can be controlled by doing good control of the uh, hyperlipidemia for that you need to do a lipid profile done and you know whatever the physician advises although it is these spots do not go with treatment but the progression stops with medical treatment and to remove them you have to consult a plastic surgeon next is blepharitis or the inflammation of the lid margins in poorly controlled diabetes the lid margins are inflamed and usually it is a infection by staphylococci for that blepharitis we need to give oral and topical antibiotics in the form of a ointment the cornea sometimes has a diminished sensitivity to touch because of poor glycemic control and we can test it by bringing a cotton wick from the side and touching it on the cornea the patient will not wink because the sensitivity is gone the consequences are as the patient has lesser sensitivity there is tendency towards corneal ulceration and the disastrous complications of ulcer on the cornea coming on to the next involvement intraocular pressure is raised in diabetics it is more common to have glaucoma in diabetics and for that routine screening of intraocular pressure and monitoring is required every year otherwise also glaucoma is a silent killer basically primary open angle glaucoma poag is painless thief of the eyesight and one should monitor intraocular pressure in all diabetics these days it is said that all people above the age of 40 should get a regular eye screening done especially for glaucoma and refractive errors next is new vascular glaucoma new vascular glaucoma is common in diabetics the cause is that there is anoxia of the ocular tissues resulting onto formation of vegf that is vascular endothelial growth factor which stimulates new vessel formation and these new vessels they creep over the angle of the anterior chamber from where the aqueous is drained and when there is obstruction in the angle of the anterior chamber there is a intractable form of glaucoma which does not respond to any type of medical therapy next is asteroid hyalosis asteroid hyalosis is a opacification of the vitreous body and you can see white or translucent opacities in the vitreous which hamper the vision to a certain extent but the patient feels a little discomfort that's all because they are not fully opaque they are just translucent another complication of poorly controlled diabetes is uveitis 
Uveitis is an inflammation of the uveal tissue, which is the middle layer of the eyeball, including the iris, ciliary body, and the choroid. Whenever there is inflammation of the uveal tissue, there are fibrinous exudates in the anterior chamber, and these the echoes becomes turbid, and the patient is not able to see clearly. Apart from that, the patient has pain in the eye and there can be rise in intraocular pressure also. This uveitis can be treated with topical steroids and cyclopelagics apart from good control of diabetes. Uveitis if left uncontrolled can lead on to glaucoma as well as cataract. The pupillary responses in the eye are due to sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation. The parasympathetic innervation leads to constriction of the pupil through the constrictor pupillary muscles and the sympathetic innervation leads to dilatation of the pupil or due to the sympathetic fibers through the dilator pupillary muscle. These can be or responses can be altered in hyperglycemia due to involvement of these nerves in diabetes. Next is, which is very common, that is changes in refraction due to poorly controlled diabetes mellitus. The lens changes, intraocular lens, it changes its hydration, which is the normal crystalline lens, whenever there is poor glycemic control. And when the diabetes is controlled, the hydration status is again changed, leading on to frequent changes in refraction with the state of control of the diabetes. So whenever there are frequent changes in refraction in a diabetic patient, we should suspect uncontrolled diabetes mellitus and treat it accordingly. Cataract is a very common manifestation of poorly controlled diabetes and the most typical form of cataract in diabetes is called snowflake cataract. The treatment is again good control of the glycemia, hyperglycemia and you have to remove the cataractus lens and implant IOL after controlling the diabetes. Next is a surgical problem which is called intraoperative floppy iris syndrome. The iris in diabetics becomes very fragile and when we are doing it keeps on coming into the phaco probe again and again and which could lead to injury to the iris tissue and bleeding and subsequently the surgery can be messed up. So one has to be very careful while operating a diabetic to take care of a floppy iris. Now coming on to the most devastating complication of diabetic retinopathy which is very common in hyperglycemia of long standing duration. Good control of diabetes delays the onset of retinopathy by quite a few years but the age of diabetes is very important apart from good control of diabetes in diabetic retinopathy. The longer the years the patient has diabetes mellitus, the more the chances of developing diabetic retinopathy. Now, the diabetic retinopathy starts as a background diabetic retinopathy, which consists of microaneurysms, intraretinal hemorrhages, and heart exudates. Microaneurysms are a weak spots on the retinal vessels, retinal vessels, and these weak spots are due to microangiopathy induced by diabetes. As a result, the small aneurysms developed on the retinal vessels. These microaneurysms in due course of time burst and there are small intraretinal hemorrhages. These hemorrhages over a period of time, the RBCs they hemolyze and what is left behind are hard exudates which are basically lipid deposits evolved from the retinal hemorrhages. Next is the stage after the background or a non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy is the pre-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. The pre-proliferative diabetic retinopathy consists of intraretinal microvascular abnormalities, venous beading, and cotton wool spots. The cotton wool spots are basically not related to microandrisms or hemorrhages. They are ischemic nerves which sort of giving a look of exudates. Intraretinal microvascular abnormalities seen proliferative phase and we can see venous beating also. These are common manifestations. Cotton wool spots as I already said due to ischemia of the nerve fiber layer because of poor vascular supply due to diabetic retinopathy. Last and the most dreaded complication of diabetic retinopathy is proliferative diabetic retinopathy. First of all, there can be a new vascularization of the disc. Then there can be a new vascularization elsewhere in the fundus. There can be pre-retinal vitreous hemorrhages. There can be a tractional retinal detachment. And last is 
the neovascularization of the iris or the angle of the anterior chamber. Now, neovascularization of the disc, as the name suggests, is vascularization over the optic disc in response to ischemia. Preretinal and retinal hemorrhages, as I already told, are due to bursting of the aneurysms and the hemorrhages are basically superficial hemorrhages which sometimes go into the vitreous and they lead on to opacification of the vitreous and loss of vision. These hemorrhages later on lead on to fibrosis in the vitreous and there are traction bands which pull the retina towards the vitreous and there is a consequent retractional retinal detachment. Next is the diabetic macular edema. As we all know, macula is the central part of the retina and this area is responsible for the sharpest vision. But this area also has a area where there is no vascular supply and whenever there is exudation in the retina, the exudates take a long time to absorb and there is a macular edema in the diabetic patients which are poorly controlled. There can also be another type of cystic macular edema. This is a OCT scan of the retina called optical coherence tomography in which we can see small cystic spaces in the layers of the retina. These cystic spaces contain fluid and they hamper the vision up to a large extent. Now, what is the treatment for this retinal hemorrhages and uh, macular edema, diaptic macular edema? We have to give an intraventricular injection of Leucentis, a drug called Leucentis, and this is basically an anti VEGF or vascular endothelial growth factor drug, and this leads to absorption of the hemorrhages and at the same time, the new vessel formation is delayed. We have to repeat uh, quite a few injections this uh, monthly depending on the response of the patient. Now, the visual fields, these need to be monitored to see the damage caused by the raised intraocular pressure. And this is a visual field analyzer. Whenever there is a diabetic retinopathy, we take care of the new vessels with the help of a photocoagulator. And we have to do a retinal photocoagulation and if you do a pan retina photocoagulation, it is called PRP. Here you can see the PRP spots over the retina after a retinal photocoagulation has been done. Now these are the visual field charts. Now the next consequence of diaptic involvement in the eye is optic neuritis. It can be uh, anterior ischemic optic neuritis which is called AION. It can be a, a resolved ischemic optic neuritis and Last is when the optic neuritis does not resolve, it leads on to atrophy of the eye and absolute blind eye. Now, why screen population of diabetics? Because incidence of blindness in diabetes is 50 to 65 per lakh diabetic population per year in Europe. Retinopathy is the commonest cause of visual impairment in type 1 diabetes. 39% type 2 have retinopathy at diagnosis. 4 to 8% is sight threatening. Early stages can be asymptomatic. If left unchecked, can progress rapidly towards permanent visual impairment. Treatment with laser photocoagulation is more successful if performed while patient is symptom free. Advantages is accessibility, double reading of images for quality assurance, high sensitivity and sensitivity for picking up sight threatening type retinopathy. Risk factors for worsening of retinopathy, poor glycemic control, sudden tightening of control, systemic hypertension, duration of diabetes, microalbuminuria and proteinuria, pregnancy, serum cholesterol for macular exudates and edema. Thank you from me and my small family. Have a good day.